Like yeah, okay. Windows, exit, wings, yeah. <laughs> Good morning. A um, few admin notes in case of emergency. Please exit the doors. There are doors at both ends, by the way. If it gets full in the back of the room, just walk, walk around and come to the other door. Uh, exits are located out to your right. OSR folks, please take off your badges, your OSR badge. Um, remember that this is being streamed live, so when you ask your questions, keep that in mind. And we will try to get the microphone to you, so if you could just wait a few seconds so the people that are listening will hear your questions. Uh, also, briefings are 35 minutes in length and five minutes for questions, so please keep that in mind. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Pat Roach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the second day of the 2014 Air Force Office of Scientific Research Spring Review. Uh, today, I think you're going to witness, again, uh, some very great, exquisite, and rich science. Uh, I have the privilege of introducing the Quantum and Non-Equilibrium Processes Division for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, where it's also been my privilege and pleasure to serve as the department chair in this division. Uh, this name is kind of an interesting name to me because otherwise I would simply say that this is physics, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, but with that in mind, I'm going to sort of go through a couple of things real quick, and that's just sort of an overview, that we're going to talk about organization, we're going to talk about some of our goals, uh, we're going to talk about our mission and DOD relevance, our people, and we're going to move into an example after I go through all of that as to what we do in AFOSR uh, in this division, to an example of how do you stand up a portfolio, which when I came here, I was not given a portfolio per se, I was asked to stand up a portfolio. And, and, and many folks coming in, many new program officers, have to do this. So I thought I would go through that a bit with you and to describe how that works and describe some of the things that are going on in there. I think it's going to be an exciting portfolio for the Air Force and answer some really relevant questions for the Air Force for the future. But with that in mind, the first thing I sort of want to do is let you know where we sit within the organization. As Dr. Matz and Dr. Carrick described yesterday, we had a reorganization this last year which created five divisions, of which RTB, the Quantum and Non-Equilibrium Division, is part of that. Where we sit within that scheme of things is we report directly to the basic uh, program office, which is Dr. Carrick, and therefore then to the director, which is also, in the acting capacity, Dr. Carrick, in this case. Uh, we're soon to have a new director, but what this affords us within these divisions is the opportunity opportunity to have input directly to senior leadership on the way we actually execute our portfolios, which is very critically important to how we manage. Oops, too far. So I'm sort of going a little bit backwards, and so for lack of a better word, what is it we do in this quantum and non-equilibrium processes department? And essentially, we look uh, fundamentally at quantum processes. Uh, we look at plasma physics and high energy density, non-equilibrium processes, as well as optics and electromagnetics. That has been our staple, our mainstay, and this year we did something new in terms of this new portfolio that I'm talking about, is we have expanded into biophysics. One may say, why do you care about bio or biologically inspired kinds of things? Let me answer that question right up front. Without it, you don't do weapons efficacy. Without it, you don't field active denial technology. Without it, you do not protect your air crews with laser eye protection that prevents blindness, permanent blindness for the rest of their lives. Now, these are the kinds of things that are important to the Air Force but have no meaning to places like NIH or the National Science Foundation and those kinds of areas. We collaborate fully with our partners in the international offices, okay? One of the things I'm going to describe in this new portfolio is how we, as an example of how the rest of the program officers within RTB, interacts with international, okay? So everything that we do here has a counterpart in the international office, right? Directly into that link through <coughs> folks like John Kongluski at EOARD, through folks like Lieutenant Colonel Jamont Chen 
at or Aord, okay, which we'll describe in a bit. But again, these things are really important. And what do those things bring to us? They bring us information that we can then funnel directly into the Air Force Research Laboratory and their mission. Next slide. So now I want to get directly to our mission. Our mission is basically to lead the discovery and transition of foundational physical science to enable air, space, and cyber power. This got a little bit twisted around, so it was going to go top down. I was going to say ASDR and E requirements first, but because of some changes, we're going to talk about Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Air Force S and T requirements, which were lauded two years ago and are still current today, right? That is, we are driven by and we support directly autonomy in human systems, development in autonomous systems, which are direct links to one another within the DOD and the Air Force. Through ASDRE, which is under change right now, we support directly five of the six areas that are requirements for the Department of Defense. But we don't do this in a vacuum. We require our most precious resource to actually execute these kinds of things, which is our folks. And these are, these are the folks right here. And I can't tell you what a privilege or a pleasure it is to work with some of the brightest uh, folks that there are in the Air Force, the Department of Defense, or for that matter, in the sciences that they represent, the disciplines they represent. Without them, there is no opportunity to move forward. We have a new person coming in, uh, Miss Ellen Montgomery. I'm uh, sorry, but her picture's not up here. I certainly would like to show that next time as our new program coordinator. Uh, we'll have her up next and, and, and let you know that. But most recently, Dr. Jason Marshall has just arrived from uh, the Direct and Energy Directorate at Kirtland Air Force Base uh, in New Mexico, and we're welcoming him in December, the new PCS. So how do we execute things? And I show this chart uh, carefully, and I really, it's not about the dollars per se, but what it really goes to is how we sort of manage to the Air Force Research Laboratory's uh, portfolio. 32% of our overall this last year is spent internally in the laboratory system. That's an important issue. And the reason that's an important issue is because we strive very carefully to have portfolios that are university driven and background that actually can support Air Force mission in real time. So I would say that we're doing a pretty good job of, of partnering with the Air Force Research Laboratory and looking for those things to put in there. Now, does that mean that that's all that we do? It is not. We actually look for high risk items right, that aren't necessarily things that are being done in the Air Force Research Laboratory that may be of value to the Air Force in the future. So we do have that opportunity, but we have a mainstay in the way that we approach the work that we do. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the portfolios real quickly. So your first today you're going to hear from Dr. Howard Sloshberg on laser and, and optical physics. He's going to talk about ceramics for high power lasers. Uh, I think you're going to find that very interesting because there has been some very recent developments in the area of ceramics, especially with erbium, dope, strontium, FAP. Dr. Tatiana Kerchik, again, is going to talk about atomic and molecular physics. Uh, I can't do the job that she does justice to tell you the kinds of things that she's going to tell you about this, about atomic and molecular physics, but I want you to listen carefully to what she has to say because it's very important. Such things as being able to have precision navigation for the future hinge upon the work that she's actually trying to do. Dr. John Lugensland will talk about the plasma and electromagnetic energetic uh, physics program. I showed this last time, I'm showing it again because what is this? This is called Bumpy. This is something created out of what has been one of the great successes uh, of AFOSR, which is IcePIC, the ability to model and create uh, uh, magnetrons of this type, not only just create them, but actually size them, do the swap and the link properly to actually put them on platforms to fly them. And John's going to talk about that a little bit later on. Dr. Julie Moses, unfortunately, will not be with us today. But again, important things to us are understanding uh, propagation, electromagnetic radiation. She runs the remote sensing and imaging physics portfolio. Uh, also, situational awareness or space situational awareness because junk in space is actually important to us, especially to Space Command. <coughs> Dr. Kent Miller is going to talk about space weather. Kent's work is singularly unique among all the federal agencies among the DOD, all the other f funding agencies when it comes to space weather. He is touted by NASA as having some of the best folks working in, in terms of uh, uh, space weather. Why is space weather or space science important to us? If we have what he calls or describes to me as Carrington events, 
we could lose all of our GPS capability if we don't understand what's going on or what's possible with that. And I'll let him talk to that a little bit later on. Dr. R.G. Nachman runs the electromagnetics theoretical uh, work that we have, and R.G. has a recent success here uh, in looking at how radars uh, can actually be, be aided by materials, for example, in the composite of the aircraft and the tail itself, with materials where the waves, electromagnetic waves, can actually wrap around that and not have a blind spot for that aircraft, actually have a continuous viewing point. And I'll let him talk to that a little bit later on. Dr. Rick Parra is one of our most recent portfolios, uh, certainly not, not now not the newest, but certainly one of the most recent. And Rick's going to talk to you a lot about different kinds of things going on with that. I don't want to steal his thunder, but what has Rick been doing most recently for the Air Force? Rick has been directly supporting Air Combat Command's chief scientist, Dr. Janet Fender, and their desire to understand what goes on with ultra-short laser pulse effects. Okay? I'll let Rick get into that a little bit later. I'm going to talk about biophysics. I've given you some background as to why I think that is an important area. One thing I'm going to highlight is the fact that we are somewhat behind in terms of the world when it comes to things like optogenetics. Who cares, right? That sounds like something that medicine ought to be concerned about. Optogenetics is the ability to take living molecules, create them, create them synthetically, drive them with light, and create new materials that can revolutionize things for the Air Force for the future. I guarantee NIH does not look into those kinds of things. Next slide. Dr. Jason Marshall also will not talk today. Uh, I think John's going to talk a lot about uh, Jason's uh, work with us. Jason has been actually uh, leading PCASE and YIP programs for us and doing a great job. He's revolutionized the way that things turn around, timelines, getting things out the door in a very uh, a timely manner. But he's also been running the electromagnetics uh, portfolio while John is over uh, taking care of our money uh, at SAF AQR. Uh, and so uh, John's going to talk more about Jason's work there. But Jason will not be talking this time, but next time he will. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk about the creation of a portfolio. It's going to be sketchy because I just did it. Literally this year, I just created this portfolio. I have 14 minutes, Rick. So you might say, you come in here and you go, how do you create a portfolio? Yeah. Right? Do you think about out of thin air? Do you have the background in this to do this? You know, what are the kinds of things? Well, the first thing that you really ought to look at is, is there Air Force relevance in what you're going to do? Is there a mission to be accomplished here? And if there is, is there basic science, because that's our mission, to be performed to do that? The first thing you have to do is define that area. And I've defined biophysics here as the physical biology with the aim of answering fundamental physics questions through the application of principles and methods of physical sciences. Okay? That's the aim. I've identified four areas, biomolecular imaging, below the diffraction limit, to particles that are smaller than the wavelength that's actually interrogating them. You say, oh, we ought to be able to do that today. Well, certainly we can. The problem is if you create a photon field so strong and you're looking at things, you could destroy the thing that you're trying to look at. How might you go about that? The next area is bioelectronics. The next area, electromagnetic perturbation. And the final area, the big buzzword, is quantum biology, right? Understanding quantum biology. Why? Because quantum science is one of our main thrusts within this division, but also quantum information science. How do quantum processes and signal processes occur within living material, for example? So to get at that, again, we have to talk about Air Force relevance, right? We do this with partnership with the Tech Directorate. The Tech Directorate that we're mostly working with right now is Dr. Morley Stone in the 7-11th Human Performance Wing at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and down at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. Those are, those are our key ends to what is going to be necessary for answering questions for the warfighter for the future. So under biomolecular imaging, we just picked up a brand new start by a fellow by the name of Warwick Bowen at Queensland University uh, in Australia. Now, why would this be important? Because he has figured a way to trap using YAG, trap particles that are smaller than the wavelength that's actually holding them there in place. And then he back illuminates them with 532 nanometers, and he's able to see scattering events occur. Now, can he image the molecule yet? The hope is that he can. 
But the way that we're working this is internationally. And one of the agreements that we put in place on this particular grant was that during the summertime, students and faculty from Queensland University will come to the United States and work at Fort Sam Houston. Researchers from Fort Sam Houston will go to Queensland University and work with them to understand this, and they will exchange. I'll talk more about how we're centering this within the laboratory system. There are two other efforts that we just started funding, one on a YIP, uh, one on another core, uh, and hopefully next year I'll have some real results to show you on that. Our next area is bioelectronics. We don't have anything going on in this area yet, but I want to see this be the underpinning for theoretical work for the future. If you look here, what has been described in terms of how your body works to some degree, okay, at the molecular level, is through a series of voltage-dependent channels. People have modeled circuits after mammalian cells, for example, and it does a pretty good job on the macroscopic scale. And in fact, Alan Hodgkin and uh, Andrew Huxley developed what is called the Hodgkin-Huxley model back in 1952 using four very simple, ordinary differential equations to sort of describe what was going on electrically in the system. And they had pretty good results. So much so, in 1963, they won the Nobel Prize for their model. The problem is, is that this is okay if you're at the macroscopic level, but if you go below the macroscopic level to understand what is going on across the cell membrane, for example, you really can't use this to describe that. So with that in mind, next area that we look at is electromagnetic perturbation. Dr. Bennett Ivey at the 7-11th Human Performance Ring is, do, Ring is doing that work. Let's talk about how electromagnetic energy actually interacts with matter, just for a moment, try to understand that. If you go from hours and millivolts on the left-hand side of the chart, you can actually cause electrotaxis to occur. I and mean, you can observe that quite easily, right? Cells kind of come apart. If you go to shorter duration and you increase the field on there, you get deformation of the cells, right? As you go shorter in time and higher in field strength, you can cause poration. Now, poration is not a good thing because cells don't recover and they don't recover their functioning. However, what Dr. Ivey has been doing for a few years at the AFOSR's dollar is looking at when you go to nanoseconds and even higher fields, you can cause nanoporation and the cell recovers its functionality. Recovers its functionality. Now one of the things we'd like to understand with that is, we're doing this sort of in situ in the laboratory. Can we do this with a free, plain standing wave? That's the question. Can that occur? If that can occur, we can do a lot of interesting things in terms of long distance interrogation of living matter. In quantum biology, we just stood up a brand new effort this year down at Fort Sam Houston with Dr. Uh, Brer Hope, uh, Hope Brer. And that is to understand the purpose of this is quantum mechanical transmission of electromagnetic signals in biological membranes. What's going on here is, is that the belief that if you look at the potential, about 100 millivolts across that membrane, a couple of things are observed. You see thickening of the membrane and you see heat liberation. None of these fit the Hodgkin-Huxley model at all, okay? So the idea now is, how do we go about understanding this? And the thing that's being put forth is to try to understand how solitonic waves may be at play here, or at least the theory from solitons is at play here to understand how signal transduction occurs across that membrane. And that's what Dr. Hope and that team is gonna go after. I'd like to give you an example of the people that we work with in the quantum and non-equilibrium processes division. Um, at the 7-11th Human Performance Wing, we believe we work with the best, not only in the laboratory, <coughs> but at university. This is Dr. Brer, uh, Hope Brer and Dr. Bennett Ivey. Uh, their postdoc there, Gary Thompson, uh, has just been recognized by the National Academy of Sciences for the work in nanoporation on mammalian cells. Okay? But that's not the only success that we can derive and we can cling on to from AFOSR. We have great successes in great uh, many other areas. And the one that is really important to us is the fielding of weaponizable technology such as CHAMP. 100% success in its field trials during the summer of 2012. 
That is a direct result of investment by Air Force Office of Scientific Research, not only into bumpy ice pick, but also into cathode science and other kinds of things that make this possible. And John's going to tell you more about that later because that is really critical to how we see our future for the Air Force. And lastly, from Dr. Tatiana Kerchuk's portfolio, it's not only about the great scientists and stuff, but it's also about the level of scientists that we have. And from her portfolio in atomic and molecular physics, in 2011, uh, Mark Gruner actually got uh, the um, uh, MacArthur Genius Award um, uh, for his work in condensed matter physics. The Nobel Prize was given to David Weiland in atomic physics at the University of Colorado in 2012, again, part of Dr. Kirchick's portfolio. And this last year, another MacArthur Genius Fellowship was given to Anna Marie Ray in atomic physics. We feel that we do the best work that we possibly can to the best of our ability for the United States Air Force. And with that, I will ask if there are any questions. Not hearing any, uh, Dr. Howard Slashburton.